Hello, I'm Sarah. This is Hardcover Hearts, and this is my week of reading wrap up where I talk about the books that I read this week, what I'm currently reading, and then potentially what I could read next week. I had an absolutely phenomenal reading week, uh, but uh, as you may have noticed, I didn't post anything last week because I needed time to kind of absorb. Uh, you'll see what I mean uh, when I talk about the books that I read. So let's go ahead and jump right in. So the first thing that I completed, uh, this is with uh, Elizabeth of Bookish North. We finished The Years by Virginia Woolf. So I've been talking about my uh, utter sadness and disappointment with Virginia Woolf as a, not as a creative mind, but as a moral mind. Uh, her racism is has been in every single book, save I think the first one. And it's just getting more pronounced. There is such horrible depictions of gleeful, joyous anti-Semitism in this book that go unchecked. There's also just casual racism just kind of thrown out using a derivative or a, or a diminutive of um, the N-word as just like a, a random thing that these white uh, entitled people just kind of throw out. And uh, it's, it ruins it for it absolutely ruins it for me. And please don't come here and tell me that we can't look, we, we shouldn't judge history based on current standards because it's the standards were the same then, you know, like anti-Semitism and racism has been wrong for a long, long time. A long, long time. Uh, way longer than Virginia Woolf has been in existence. And she ran with educated, smart, erudite, uh, the Bloomsbury crowd, you know. So it's not that she was sheltered. Um, so I just, I take umbrage and I, and I get very, very upset uh, when I see it, it repeated in every single book. And I could see that if you don't read all of her work in order, that it's very easy to kind of shrug it off, but please don't, <laughs> please don't. Um, and so this book started so strong. It started so well in with a family scene in this home. We have many children of differing ages and upstairs, the mother's dying. The mother is quite frankly and quite literally on her deathbed and life is just kind of continuing uh, underneath, uh, downstairs. And I, I just found that to be fascinating. And the emotional uh, disconnect that some of the family members felt where, oh, is she dead yet? Uh, horrible, but, but true, you know, horrible, but realistic. Uh, and so just that was an interesting, really interesting way to kind of get this started. Uh, but as it kind of went through the years, uh, for me, I just kind of lost the thread, lost the plot. And then when I like kind of like the th the after the halfway mark, when the racism just kept and anti-Semitism kept appearing, it, it it turned me off and there wasn't anything for me to hold on to. The story became a little less uh, co uh, cogent and 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 the characters less less held together. Um, so this wasn't, I, I really felt that the beginning was strong, but it, by the end, you know, we're supposed to be following this family through the years and it's supposed to be a huge, like her big anti-war novel. And it just didn't come through for me, um, at all. So just very disappointed in this one. And we have one more left and then I'll be able to kind of do a full wrap up of my experiences with reading Virginia Woolf. Um, okay, and then I finished The Fugitive. So this was the sixth book in The In Search of Lost Time by Marcel Proust. So the, this, this volume has both. It has the prisoner and the fugitive uh, bound together, but, but traditionally they're thought of as two separate volumes. I found, I discovered that that there is a reason why uh, on the back half of this of this series that I've been racing through and that is that his brother actually finished the the book for him through all these manuscripts and all the papers that he had and so it it does read different uh, it reads more plot heavy um, there's more 
action from one thing to the next. Uh, and we're more familiar with the characters, more familiar with uh, the place and setting. Uh, but it, this was, was phenomenal. Uh, it, it broke my heart at the very beginning. I don't want to say too much about it, but we have a lot of, uh, a lot of interesting things happening in the, in the plot to a lot of the characters, but we also have a lot of returns. So uh, what Marcel Proust does so well is cyclical writing. Uh, and something that you think has happened and, and it's kind of gone and in the past comes back, um, like memory, and uh, which is like the biggest theme of, of this book. So really enjoyed that. And then I'm s excited and very, very sad to say that I'm done. I finished, uh, this is the last volume, Finding Time Again. It's also called Time Regained. Uh, my God, this is one of the best wrap ups, the best finales of a series. And you'll notice I bear like no tabs uh, because it's just it's not it, I wasn't reading it in that way. I found my rhythm. Just go, 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 go. Um, what I think he did tremendously well in this is bring it all back to Combray, all back to, to where he started. And this is where we really see how he's leveraging all of these experiences in these different volumes to become the writer that he is. Uh, this is supposed, this is like roughly mm, quasi semi-biographical. Um, but and when the author, the narrator is Marcel, but we only hear that maybe once or twice in seven volumes. Um, and he even kind of does a kind of wink like very like like your like the author of this book. He has the same name, right? Um, just remarkable. I'm going to I'm not going to talk any more about that here because I'm actually going to do a, a video uh, later today and I'll kind of prep it up and have it ready to go about why and how to read Proust, from my opinion. Um, any tips and tricks and, and what I think holistically about the series without any spoilers. I, I have to say, I, I, this, this gave me such, such a hangover. It was, I mean, like I'm getting a little <laughs> goofily um, verklempt here because uh, it's been the experience of the pandemic for me. I started this two years ago, uh, started it with Leo and um, and we started now he couldn't handle the petulant uh, teenage Marcel, which believe me, it was it was rough. Uh, but I kept going and I have been so um, comforted by the voice and the writing and exposed to so much um, that it is so sad to not have him in the background of like, okay, you should be reading some Proust tonight or, or hey, you have a, a few moments here at lunch, go ahead and read some Proust. Uh, it's been one of the best reading experiences of my life, hands down. And I'll just go ahead and say it, it's a five star. It's a five star. And for any of you who follow me, you know that I don't give five stars. Five stars to me, means that I will reread it again because I because it, it it was powerful. It had further depths to plunge. I feel like I could I could revisit it and and pull something new from it. And my God, it's never been more true. It's never been more true. Now that I get it, now that I understand how to read it, now that I understand um, how he puts his sentences together and, and the characters and um, and this world. I think rereading it in maybe 10 years <laughs> will be uh, maybe the second greatest reading experience of my life. But yeah, so you won't see me holding any of these up anymore, uh, which is time reg regained indeed. <laughs> okay, so with that said, uh, I also finished uh, something that I wanted to read in January for uh, January in Japan that I didn't get a chance to, but I put it on hold at my library and the audiobook came up. So I decided to take a to take it out for a try. 
And this was Fault Lines by Emily Itami. Uh, this is a debut novel set in Tokyo, contemporary. And we have uh, Mizuki, and she is a fairly youngish uh, woman who is married and has two very young children living in Tokyo. And she's kind of pondering her life and how did she get here? Um, you know, she w had this this very adventurous spirit and she was a singer and and she fell in love with her husband and they got married and then they had two kids and now he's rarely there if if at all and when he is he's very emotionally distant their marriage is perfunctory at this point and not very satisfying um you know she spends all of her time taking care of these children and it's you could tell that it taxes her Oh, she meets a very handsome restaurateur by chance and uh, sparks fly between them and they begin a relationship very slowly. Uh, and it has ripple effects through her life and of who she thinks about herself as well as in her marriage. I saw something that it was compared to Sally Rooney, and I think I could see that to a certain degree in the sense that it feels modern, it feels um, contemporary. Um, there is a lightness to it at the same time you're talking about um, emotional emotional things. Uh, I just I thought it was a really strong showing for a debut debut book. I enjoyed it, and yeah, I, I was very happy that I finally got to it. And the people who are saying this is really good is are, are right. Then uh, coming off reading To Paradise with Leo of a Little Book Life, someone had mentioned that the main place that anchors all three of the sections of To Paradise by Hanya Yanagihara are based in Washington Square. And it's an allusion to the Henry James book of the same name, Washington Square. <laughs> so uh, he and I, Leo and I decided we wanted to read Henry James because neither he and I have read Henry James. I, and for some reason, and it killed me that he, th he thought the same thing. I kept confusing Henry James and Thomas Hardy. And I don't know why, those are two different authors. I know that, but for some reason I kept inter mingling them in my head. And so we jumped in and we decided we were going to read this. And it's a very slim, slim, I, I would say maybe a little bit more than a novella, but it was magnificent. It's the story of Catherine, who's a young woman just coming into society. Uh, she's been raised by her father. Her mother died when she was very, very young. Her father's a doctor and very well established. Uh, because her mother died when she was young, her aunt, who also was widowed, has come in to kind of help, ostensibly help in the transition uh, right after her mother's death, but ended up just staying and living with this family. And uh, she doesn't really know her place and is a very, very funny character, uh, kind of a Dickens-esque character in this story. Catherine seems uh, at first blush, uh, maybe dull, uh, maybe not very bright, possibly reserved, shy, uh, definitely naive, for sure naive. Uh, and she's been sheltered very much so by her doctor father. And she's at a party and she meets a young man. And the aunt really tries to broker a connection and becomes very smitten with this man, Morris. So much so that she starts really uh, overstepping her boundaries, uh, which were already tenuous at best. And we see a, a standoff uh, in between uh, the father, the, the doctor, and Morris, uh, because Morris uh, could potentially be a rake. And it's just, it's too convenient, it's too fast. Catherine is too dull or plain to really be in encouraging this type of excitement from a very handsome, young, eligible man. And it becomes a battle of the wills. I, I thought it was so good. There's a wit and a gentle, there's a subtle snark to Henry James's writing that I just, I loved. It's a tiny little dagger thrust here and there and usually at the end of a chapter. And uh, I, I just, I found it completely, completely enthralling. 
this was this was great. I enjoyed it. And so Leah and I are adding to our never ending buddy read list uh, that we're going to read uh, two additional Henry James. We're going to read Portrait of a Lady and The Wings of a Dove. So if you have any particular Henry James that you love, please let us know so that we can consider adding that to the list that's never going to end. <laughs> it's just it's just going on and on and on. Um, so yeah, so that was great. And then the last thing that I finished was Portrait of an Unknown Lady. Now, this is uh, something that I did uh, from NetGalley. So thank you very much to the publishers for giving me access to this book. This is by Maria Gainza and translated by Thomas Bunstead from Spanish. And it's set in Argentina, in Buenos Aires. What I'm discovering when I'm reading Southern American contemporary fiction is that there is a, a there are expectations that I that I tend to have that are very much based on American literature or or British literature that I've grown up reading that are always seem to be challenged or or um, subverted by South American literature. Uh, and this was no different. So I think I've said a couple times, because I read it over, over a few weeks, I kept kind of deprioritizing it, uh, that it started off as an, uh, an art forgery kind of caper, where this young woman gets this job um, as a, someone who is, who is helping this amazing um, art critic who's, who's authenticating art. Um, she finds out that that woman is actually embedded, embedded with a forgery ring, and an amazing forgery ring of all these bohemian, very interesting people. And it's gone back years. And when that woman passes away suddenly, uh, that was kind of where I'd left it last time, I wasn't sure was she gonna take up the helm and kind of lead this, this uh, ragtag troop of older forgers, um, or were they, were they even gonna let her? And it took a completely different turn. It didn't go in that direction at all. She ended up not being able to emotionally handle that and it became a, a, a meditation on grief. So she ended up leaving the, that, that uh, job and trying something new. And she wanted to find who that forgering, the original forger was. And so she's meeting and chasing all of these people down and trying to find out this illusory woman who has all of these fables kind of created about her as a means to maybe understand this other woman better. Uh, it's, it's very loose. Uh, it's the plot kind of starts to lose its way. Uh, the writing is really fun. Uh, it, it's an interesting, it's an interesting book. I enjoyed it, but I don't know that it held together. But do I need it to? I, um, it entertained me and it had me questioning things. And I think I'm, I, I'm, I am more interested in reading more Southern, Southern American literature. Um, to kind of get a, a better feel for uh, books like this. So that's what I read, pretty remarkable, right? I did also read uh, the first of my Book Two Prize readings I have to do. I have six books I need to read this between this month and next month. I finished one, I'm into my second, and this is in the, in the translated fiction category. And it's just, it's such a joy, it's such a joy. Uh, so I can't say any more about that. Um, all right, but let's talk about what I'm currently reading. Uh, so uh, we are returning back to our Anita Bruckner project, of course, me and Leo of A Little Book Life. <clears throat> oh, and I need to make mention, I can't believe I didn't say it earlier, uh, Leo is going to be pausing his channel and uh, he, because he's finding a lot of engagement on Instagram and he's enjoying that very much. So he is a little book life on Instagram. Uh, make sure that you follow him there, please. And so we're going to pick up our 18th Anita Bruckner together, and this is falling slowly. And the way we read these now, we used to read like three chapters at a time because her writing is just so dense and there's always so many beautiful things to to uh, pick out, um, but after 18 books, we, we kind of know the score and she is a bit formulaic. 
So now we just read to the halfway point, check in, and then uh, read to the end. So we'll be reading that. I mentioned that Elizabeth of Bookish North and I are going to be finishing the Virginia Wolf between the acts. So I'll be reading that and then continuing with my book two prize reading. So that's it. I'm going to be doing two additional videos this week. Very unusual. Um, the first one is why and how to read Proust. And then the second one is I'm fine. I finally have my list of favorites. Uh, so I'm going to be doing like I did last year, where I have groupings of the books that meant a lot to me that I, in reflection, when I look through my Goodreads and my list, they just make my heart flutter still. And so I'll be sharing that in uh, two videos, break it into two. So that's it for me. I hope you had a fantastic week and I'll look forward to talking to you soon. Bye.